welcome. Close this down uh, like this and um, made a bunch of games. I wanted to just prep you for the kinds of stuff I've, I've done uh, in the past. Um, this is a uh, Fingal for those uh, not familiar. Oh yeah, oh yeah. This was my uh, my first game, a long time ago. We're talking about maybe um, seven years ago. Jeez, eight, almost eight years ago. Back when I um, was made, making awkward social games for um, for school, for a graduation project, trying to figure out what to uh, what to do with my life. Uh, made a bunch of like m truly social multiplayer games. And uh, one of them was this one, where people had to touch each other, and it really, really worked out. Um, a lot of people got into relationships because of uh, Finkel. It's really great. Um, and after that, uh, actually, that game was pretty, did pretty well. Like, it funded Game Oven, a studio I co-founded with someone else, uh, and it funded it for like three or four years. And uh, that gave me time to experiment, do some more weird stuff. Uh, among that was uh, Bounden. Uh, this game, two people, they hold on to the same phone and um, the phone tells those people how to dance together using this strange interface. Um, and I had the, uh, the Dutch National Ballet help me make the choreography for, uh, for this game, which was awesome. And I think there's a shot over here of them. Pretty cool. So yeah, that's, um, that's the kind of stuff I've done in the past. Now, actually, let's look for a Hidden Folks video. Uh, for those not familiar, I assume most of you know about it. Let's make it bigger. So, black and white searching game. Seems pretty simple, I'd say. Um, this was um, released last year in February. That's great. Okay, you get the point. Uh, we've all. I hope you've played it. If not, try it. Um, so there was a day in. I believe it was November 2014 that I went to a graduation exposition of the, the, the Rietveld Academy in the Netherlands, which is a very artsy-fartsy school. Very artsy-fartsy. Like most people there, they would make stuff that without context would be completely ridiculous. Like you would go into a, a little room where there was dirt on the floor and then you'd be like, okay, there's dirt on the floor and you have to take off your shoes and work through dirt. And then you're like, okay, I walk through dirt and then there would be this whole conceptual like, idea around it that you would totally not get from just looking at the dirt. So that's the kind of art they make a lot. But also, there was this one guy there. Um, oh, this is for later. Um, where am I gonna? I have, I have a picture of this exposition he had and um, I was looking at his work, and I was very impressed, actually, not necessarily by the things he had made for that, uh, for that specific uh, um, exposition, but I was looking at the backgrounds, because the backgrounds were these little miniature worlds that were really beautiful and delicate, and there was a lot of stuff happening in those tiny worlds. And I was super intrigued by that, and not necessarily by the, by the globes that he actually made. Let me actually look up that, those globes, because... Um, yeah, here. So this is, this is the, the exposition. I don't know if you can see it very well, but there's these glass globes that, he, that's, uh, that this guy made, and he, he put some li li little created, like little chairs and 
strange objects in them, but I was super way more intrigued by, um, by the backgrounds. So I met the guy and I, I jokingly said to him, hey, wow, your art's amazing. Um, that was not a joke. Uh, but I jokingly said to him, hey, we should make a game together. And um, yeah, we were, like, there was something in it and we both were like, huh, okay, maybe, maybe. And then I went back home and I was still thinking about this and I, um, at some point I decided I should email him. Um, just saying, hey, you know, we met at Gerrit Rietveld Academy when you're doing your graduation expo. Maybe we should actually like, meet up and talk about actually making a game. And before I met him, I um, took it upon me to steal art from his website. Um, and I, uh, what did I do? I think there's something. No, there's something in here about that. The very first prototype I created for, uh, yeah, that was this one. The very first prototype I created was with his stolen art website. I thought Hidden Folks was going to be a procedural searching game where I would just take his beautiful black and white art, just slap it onto some random locations, slap some random characters in there, do some magic, and then make really pretty areas where you would have to search for, uh, for things. So this was, this was the very first prototype. Um, doesn't look as good as I would, I would say as, as it looks now. Um, with stolen art from his, from his website, made in like a couple hours. Um, and so I met up with Silva, showed it to him, and uh, he was very excited even though I'd stolen his art. Um, and we decided, yeah, let's, let's slowly start working on this. Let's slowly see where this goes. And uh, yeah, that's, that's sort of how, it's all, how it all started. So the thing was, Sylvain had never thought about making a game. He had never made a game. He had never worked on a game. Um, and so we, we had to start from scratch. And actually the same sort of was also true for me. I had previously only worked with other people. Uh, who were trained in making video games and knew like the workflow of their their art or the workflow of their code or you know they knew a lot more experience in their own fields and I had been a game designer and I always had other people around me who were way better at who were very good at what they did so I had to sort of learn together with Sylvain the guy who who's, who's made who's made all this art to to sort of discover together like how are we going to make this game. And that took us a, a long time. And uh, actually, I'm gonna, I want to take you through the whole process of like where it starts and how it ends up in the game and how it actually ends up to be an interactive video game. So where it starts is here. Um, I have some pictures here of uh, the kinds of illustrations that Sylvain makes. So, um, Sylvain draws everything on a very specific paper with a very specific fine liner, uh, and he draws thousands of these elements, these tiny little uh, images, and he actually draws them very small too. That's I think part of the uh, for, part of the appeal. Um, we uh, yeah we have a lot of these. He has uh, a whole book full of all the little tiny images. Uh, that you can actually flip through and recognize all the tiny elements that, uh, that he's built. And yeah, it's, I mean, I, I find it fascinating to look at these because this is really what Hidden Folks is made out of. So we take this, he scans this. He actually, th there's a funny story about that too. He, just before we started the, the project, he bought a really bad printer, like a really bad one. And he used that to scan the first couple uh, images and I think sort of halfway through making Hin folks, his printer died and he bought a new one, a better one. But the scan quality was so good that the art also looked different. So he then got rid of that printer again and bought the bad one again so that the art style would be consistent. Um, so yeah, um, so we scan this. And then we, what we do is we make uh, sprite sheets out of this. And uh, I don't know if you're familiar with, the, with sprite sheets, but they're normally what people do is they they bring in these images into their editor and then it creates like this 
big image that contains all the images. And that's usually for optimization purposes. And I knew about this, and I was very excited about this in the beginning. I was like, yeah, we should make these sprite sheets ourselves. Such a good idea. <laughs> um, and so we did. And uh, the kinds of sprite sheets that you then get, and let me, let me grab a bigger one, are these. So he scans it in, throws it into Photoshop, uh, removes the background, plays a little bit with the contrast, but barely does so. And then he, hand, by hand, puts all the images as tightly packed together as he can, like this, into these kinds of images. So um, there's one theme in Hidden Folks that has, um, I think, four, yeah, three or four of these images. Uh, there, and we can make like about six or seven levels out of, out of these three images. Um, so yeah, all the, uh, all the art is packed into these, uh, these kinds of images. Let's see, there's other themes. So we have a city theme. Some of these images are very big. Some of them are very small. Some of them you'll be like, what are all those tiny pixels up there? But there, those are details that are very important, I think, to hidden folks. Sometimes you have these massive blocks that take up a lot of space, <laughs> like this one. Um, all the cars in hidden folks are in this sprite sheet. So yeah, um, that's where it goes. And then once we've made those, we uh, throw them into Unity. Uh, this is Unity. You might be familiar with it. And um, yeah, this is, uh, this is the project, the, the current version of the game that I'm working on every day. I open Unity, and I do some coding or some other tasks. Um, but yeah, so Sylvain actually puts them in here himself. And um, I, I never touch his, his stuff, basically. He, um, he throws them in here. He, he actually opens up this, uh, this sprite editor, which takes a long time. And then he actually like, goes in here, and he zooms in, and he draws rectangles over all these objects. And then he gives everything a, a name that makes sense. So that's already like a lot of work. And so he does that for all these images. And that's great. So then we have all these little um, parts of it. I don't know if you can see it very well, but here's, here's the, the bigger image, and then there's all these tiny parts to it. And what happens then is that we simply put it in a, in a scene. So right now, we, um, let me maximize this for you. We are in the, the scene that is the jungle tutorial, I believe, one of the first scenes in Hidden Folks. And uh, all, these, all these images are separate little objects uh, that he places one by one into this scene. Um, and because Hidden Folks is a um, 2D game, two-dimensional, uh, we need to think about uh, sorting, which means you know, what's in front and what's behind. Now, um, that seems a very trivial thing, but uh, there's a lot, of, a lot of objects in this scene. And so I had... I, when we started making Hidden Folks, we discovered, oh god, this is going to be a massive task. And so I, I very quickly built some tools in Unity. Let's sort of like, I add shortcuts on top of Unity that allow Sylvain to actually very quickly uh, change the, the sorting um, between, um, between all, the, all the other sprites that it's touching. So basically, um, he would, let me actually do the actual thing that he would do. So we're in the forest theme. We open up, say we want an, an extra beehive here. So I would drag in the beehive. This is what Sylvain would do. And then he would place it, and he would sort it manually. Now, for a small scene like this, that seems very doable. But let me open the other scene. Because, actually, let me count real quick. This scene has... 140 objects, 140 objects. But then we have this scene. <laughs> which has, let me count these and give you the exact num number, 19,474 objects. And let me just let you realize how much work this is. You see these beautiful boxes. This is one box. <laughs> this is one tiny little piece of paper. 
which had to be sorted because you know it has to be on top of the box. Um, here is, and this is also fun, like this little piece of paper had to be on top of this, but also on top of this. Oh no, there's even text on the, oh my God. So, all this, yeah, it's, it's a lot of work. Um, so yes, that's the, let's like sort of A to Z, how we, how Sylvain actually goes through from drawing to actually putting it into the game and, uh, and sorting it. So this whole process for this scene took about a month, a whole month of just like figuring out like namings, doing all the placements, slowly building upon this world. Um, slowly sorting everything uh, and putting, putting everything together. And then somewhere, maybe after a couple of weeks, when uh, Sylvain has, has sort of like the, the global structure of this area and he's already placed a couple things, that's where I jump in. And uh, in the case of this very specific scene, which is a massive, massive scene, um, I would say, hey, you know what? You built in this left bottom corner, you built this tiny tiny little area with lots of tires and there's a car that you can, maybe we can make a, an interaction of this. And I would say, okay, I want the conveyor belts to go like this and I want something to be on the conveyor belt so that the objects move. Um, and then I slowly start adding my components to it. And so how that works is as follows. So let's, let's focus on this a little bit. So there's a, as you can see, there's a, a big uh, poke over here. And what I did was I added a, a couple of scripts to it that uh, allow the player to move it. Uh, it's very simple. Some of these scripts uh, can talk to each other. Uh, most of them can actually talk to each other. And so these scripts are very generic. I, I didn't like go into the his scenes and make a script for all the, for all the little things that uh, he's made. And so there's a, a slider script over here. There's a button script on this one. Um, let's see if there's more stuff. Yeah, there's a rotation, rotation script on this, on this wheel over here. There's a lot of wheels here. Um, let's go somewhere else. Here's a garage door, which also has a slider. It's the exact same script. It just talks to different scripts. So I just go through what Sylvain makes. I talk to him, hey, maybe we can change this to that. Uh, and I also replace a lot of the objects with interactive ones by adding scripts to it, etc. Now, um, this is a very messy, messy period where, uh, and just to give you a little bit of perspective on this, this is the, uh, the hierarchy for that. Um, it's just like one massive, massive giant list of every object in the root of the full. Now, a lot of game developers look at this and be like, oh my God, oh my God, how, you, how, do you, how can you work like this? And so, we actually barely use the hierarchy. We only use it for like parenting or all the boring stuff. Um, but I, 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 we do need to manage this. And for that, again, I built some, some tools to really help us with that. And um, this is one of them where I can like, I don't know, select like this ladder and I can select all the objects that have the same sprites uh, just with the press of a button. Um, and I can either like replace them with other objects or I can save them and replace some objects that don't or do have this specific script. So we don't really use the hierarchy to, to do like object selection or whatever. We, I, I make tools that we can do so, like bigger operations basically because these kinds of scenes, they tend to get very, very big. Now I don't want to get uh, too technical, but I want to dive in just one more step so that we all under, really understand like how simple uh, folks is put together, but still that it's, it, I guess it's still a lot of work. Um, because um, from a top-down perspective, uh, and this is veering into programming territory, um, there's just one little script in every scene that checks whether there's input from the, from the player. And um, I think I'm gonna go back to the smaller scene because it's easier to show, boop, boop. jungle tutorial, do not save. Um, so every, every scene only has this one script that checks for the input, and uh, the moment you tap on the screen or you click with the mouse or you press A with the controller, um, 
It will just check, okay, where's the position of the cursor? Maybe it may be in the middle of the screen or below your finger or et cetera. It will do a raycast, which is checking whether there's any colliders. And all the, um, all the objects that you can interact with, be it have them make a sound or drag them or, I don't know, do something with it, um, they have a collider on them and they will always have this trigger script. And this is like the, I'm so proud of this um, little structure that I built because I, I was actually a really bad programmer when I started Hidden Folks and I've slowly learned it over the last three years. And so I have this gen super generic structure that there's this trigger behavior that you can, um, that's, that will always have like a trigger down, a trigger up uh, event, and then a trigger quick tap. So if you quick tap quickly enough, you'll be able to trigger something. And then with every different kind of trigger, in, um, I don't know if you can see it very well, but here I have a, a list of uh, various kinds of triggers. And it's actually, it's not that many if you think about how many kinds of interactions you can do in hint folks. Um, I have a, a list with all these triggers that will just like be, I'll be able to implement these up and down and quick tap uh, events. And then I just do with them whatever I want. So um, the, that's how the input works. And then there's one more strange uh, system. So actually, let me, let me show you all the, all the triggers here. So if you press this little guy over here, this has a trigger sound quick tap on it, which then triggers a sound called monkey uh, if you tap on it. This one triggers a wiggle and a bush sound if you, uh, trig if you press down on it quickly enough. Let's see what else is here. There's this bush, which will trigger an animation curve, and it will trigger a sound based on a value. And now we're referring into the last system I want to explain, the second system also, is that a lot of uh, things in Hidden Folks, they talk to each other. So again, I, because we have so many objects, I needed some sort of like super generic, generic system so that, for instance, a, a car, how does a car know whether it can pass uh, whether the pedestrians have crossed the street, for instance. And so I, call, I have these things called values in the game that uh, are constantly updated by the state of like a slider or like an animation. And basically everything in Hidden Folks has this. And so any animation, you'll always be able to, okay, what's the value of you? Or like you can ask a button, what's the value of you? And sometimes it will turn zero or 0 0.5 or one or anything in between. And that will actually allow me to make very complicated systems. Um, and one, um, one example of that is, uh, is actually what we do in the, in the factory. So here we have the factory. Let me actually play this. I don't know if it's maximized. Doot, doot. Yes. So here we have uh, the factory tutorial. And um, there's a slider here that adjusts the value of, no, actually it just adjusts its own value. And then there's this conveyor belt here on the left, which then asks every frame, hey, what's your value, Mr. Slider? And then depending on that, it will update the speed of the conveyor belt. And now this, this conveyor belt here actually listens to the value of the button. So once I press it, it will actually be set to one and the speed's gonna be multiplied by that. Um, and this one looks at the poke. So, and then all of these are actually also controlled by this, by this big slider in the back. So using this very simple idea, I can make these very complicated systems um, by just throwing values back and forth everywhere. Um, so that's, how, that's sort of like the, the two systems that uh, Hin Folks uses. Um, and that's sort of like uh, the, the bare bones of Hin Folks. Now, okay, that was very technical. Sorry about that. Oh, bling. Great. Um, <laughs> I'm going through this pretty quickly, maybe. Let's talk about the sounds for a little bit. Because um, the thing we do with the sounds, and as I already had this open, um, oh, Twitter. There we go. Um, all the sounds in Hidden Folks are mouth-made sounds. Uh, that was purely accidental, originally. And so what, um, what, what we do these days is we, I build small huts 
of like fluffy things in my in my room. And I make sounds like this, and it's great. And that's basically what we do. And we do this maybe like uh, once every two months or so. And we, we, we pull every time we, Sylvain draws a lot of stuff and I add a lot of interactions, we come up with a list of sounds that we're going to need. And we're gonna, we get together and we get to scream in the microphone for a couple hours, and it's great. Uh, first, we, it was just Sylvain and I who did that together. Um, at some point, uh, we needed someone to actually help us manage all these sounds because our sound library by now is actually very, very large. Uh, let me actually look that up for you. Um, here, is, here is all the sounds that we, we have. Um, it's a lot of sounds. So it, this was becoming a lot. And uh, we actually asked uh, someone else, a sound designer, Martin Fale, who is he? Where is he? There he is, that boy. Um, we asked him to help us with uh, managing these sounds. So he, he doesn't actually make the sounds. We, we still make the sounds. Actually, when we do a recording session, he just joins us on Skype and laughs at us for like two hours. Um, and it's great. And then uh, we give the recording to him. He cuts it up. Uh, he puts it in his folder, gives it pretty names. And that's, that's sort of like how, um, how we add the sounds uh, to the game. Then, I mean, beside the interactions, there's also these ambient sounds, which is, I think, honestly, actually the reason that we, we got Martin on the team, because making ambient sounds with your mouth, like in the jungle, for instance, um, it's just so weird. Um, it's, and it's, it's, it was very, I couldn't wrap my head around how to do it, but uh, Martin did an amazing job actually making this level sound like um, a jungle. Can we hear this? Pretty amazing. Monkey land. So yes, that's why we needed um, Sylvain. Of, uh, that's why we needed Martin. But yeah, the reason we did this was simply because I, ha I needed some sounds at some point. This was by far the easiest thing to do. Kind of worked out, and then we stuck with it. So I don't know, it's, uh, this sort of worked out, and it was fun. So we kept doing it. Um, yeah, so um, yeah, I guess like, I've, like I said, we, we brought Martin on the team to help us with, um, with sounds. And there were actually a lot more people on the team. And this is the part where I am going to open a lot of programs and things that normally people don't show. Because it could, it could contain like sensitive, private, secret information um, that I do not want you to put on the internet. So I'm going to ask you all to sign a friendier in your mind and to not post everything you see here on the, uh, on the internet. Thank you. Uh, and now we can uh, look at this whole team thing that, uh, that slowly grew. It started with Sylvain and I, but then Martin joined, and then other people joined. And um, um, so it became a whole operation. Um, and for that, we, uh, we use Slack. So this is uh, our Slack channel, where we uh, post uh, videos, very secret videos. Oh man, I'm so not allowed to show this. Um, but this, is to this was the first time it worked. It's so cool. Yeah, oh yeah, totally worked. Anyway, um, so yeah, this is sort of where we have really like daily in-depth conversations about what to do, um, small brainstorms, uh, little like checkups with how are you doing, who is working on which scenes, who, uh, who is doing what, um, really horrible bad lip sync reading films, which are great, I'm not gonna play them right now. Um, we also have like an updates channel that automatically um, gives you all the updates that are happening. So like cards being archived because they're done or um, version control commits uh, with like little text. Uh, and this, every time you see one of these happening, every time there's something in the updates channel, you know someone's working on the game and it's progressing, it's very motivating because you can see someone else being like, oh yeah, I just did these six things and I'll be like, Oh, I also want to do six things. So works really well for us. Um, so yeah, this is sort of like how, um, how we talk about uh, all these things. And then we have this Trello. Uh, reload page. 
what is this? Anyway, this is, um, this is our Trello. Currently, we're working on a controller city in between update. Um, also working on a beach theme and some other things. Uh, yeah, when we have these, uh, these, we have lots of cards, which are one task per card. Um, we have two labels, in progress and done. We barely use them. Uh, sometimes we do just to like, put an extra stamp on it. Uh, we assign the cards to everyone. You can, with Q, if you hit Q, you can filter all the cards to the ones you can see. It's great. This is Trello. Have you heard of it? Um, so yeah, this is like how we, how we sort of keep track of what to do. And all our ideas go in here. We have lots of more boards. Um, so yeah, that's, that's sort of like how this, uh, how this works. Um, what else should I show you? Oh yeah, version control, very important. So every time uh, someone puts an update, like we push it to the cloud, and the, I force everyone to write commit messages. And if you were at Pippin's uh, talk yesterday, I now realize my commit messages should be 10 times longer, containing all the design ideas that were changed during that update. Um, but yeah, this is a very, uh, very convenient way to see the progress of the game, et cetera. So yeah, that's uh, sort of like how, uh, how we collaborate. So um, actually, let me take you through the uh, timeline of the, of, the, of, the, of the thing, the thing. Let's see how big we can get this. This bar is massive. There we go. So this is the graph of Hidden Folks' development hours. And um, the way I made this, because not everyone on the team actually tracks their hours. As a, fed, as a matter of fact, nobody in the team tracks their hours. Um, but what I did was I look at the version history, the, the thing that we keep the latest version of, of the game on, um, and I went through our agenda and uh, distilled from those two uh, um, sources a sort of general idea of, uh, of how many hours we put in it that day. Um, so this is based on estimations and on um, version control history. And what you can see very clearly is that we started working on this in, uh, in November 2014, a long time ago, and we, we put a couple hours in. Uh, just in case you can actually read the colors, blue is me, um, Orange is uh, Sylvain. And then there's a couple of other people. Martin is somewhere in the pinkish area. And then you can see uh, Myrta, who uh, did a lot of production, helped me with production, and also made all the videos. And then there's um, Aaron at the, at the bottom, who's the light blue, who helped me with some really hard technical problems I couldn't figure out. And then uh, very in the last three months, there's been uh, Celine, who is helping me with um, Lots of the level design. But yeah, let's actually talk about the, this timeline. So I want to talk about this gap over here. Because we were very, very, from the start, we were actually very excited to work on this game. We were slowly figuring out how to do it and how to actually make these areas. Um, but this was the part where we decided Hidden Folks was going to be a free-to-play game. And we were looking at this massive amount of work in order to make that work. Like, I don't know, does, has anyone here made a free-to-play game? Okay, there's a couple of hands. Then you know how much work it is and how, like, how hard you have to be on both the fun of your game but also getting people to actually put money into your game or watch those ads. And so we were looking at that. And for months... We were so demotivated by the idea of making that game that we just didn't work on the game at all. And then, but then, when we decided, hey, you know what, let's not make a free-to-play, let's make it premium, boom. Super motivated and happy uh, to work on it. So, yeah, that was, that was, that was a thing that happened. A big mistake, trying to make a free-to-play game. Um, never again. But that's uh, my personal opinion, of course. So... After that, uh, we started working on Hidden Folks. We kind of like got the hang of it, and we slowly started working on making the actual game. And we always thought from the beginning that this was going to be a half-year project. Um, that didn't work out at all. And so in November, we were like, okay, we're going to make like 
five really good levels, and then you know, at least we have something, and then we can release it and see whatever we do after that. So we started working in November, worked on it a little bit in December, some more in January, and then end of February was GDC, and I took the game to GDC, and I played a lot with press and other developer friends, and concluded, hey, okay, this version that we have, it's great, but we need to redo it entirely, because now we know what we want. And so we started working on that in January, in February, or in, uh, in February, in March, and in April, there was PAX East, a consumer uh, show in Boston, where we also showed the game, again, this version, and we were like, okay, this is the one, we're gonna show it, and it's gonna be great, and again, we play it with hundreds of people, and we're like, okay, this was great indeed, but now we know what we want. And so we continue work. There was a little bit of a gap because going to conferences is pretty exhausting. Uh, we slowly started working um, on the actual build of the game. And uh, then uh, Gamescom happened, which was, I believe, in August. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, and again, we had a version of the game that felt like, okay, this is the one. Now we know what to do. And after, I think, five, ten-hour days of being on this horrible, horrible show that's called Gamescom, which is also awesome, but also very exhausting. Um, we realized, hey, you know what? This version is great, but now we know really what to do. And that's sort of like the, 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 the idea we got from that, the ideas uh, we got from that were the ideas that we took on to become the actual game. So after August, we started working on the actual levels. Um, and um, as you can see, that slowly ramped up, or actually it didn't slowly ramp up. It's ramped up pretty, um, pretty quickly. Um, so in November, we started working on this big idea. We wanted to have four big themes with every theme, at least one really big area. Like the factory you saw, we wanted that to be there with the release. And I think it was somewhere in December that we saw like, oh my God, we will never be able to do this. We cannot make four themes. And a lot of people would say, okay, well, you know what, maybe we got the whole theme and we do less levels and it's, it's gonna suck and maybe we can do it in an update. But instead of looking at this as a, as a very negative thing, we thought, oh, you know what? This may be a good opportunity to just promise all our players that more is coming. And also give them the, give them the opportunities to subscribe to our newsletter. And if they wanted to go to the next level, great, but you have to wait to subscribe here. Um, so actually we took it very positively and, and sort of like took it as a, a marketing opportunity. So we released with uh, three themes uh, eventually. Um, and to, um, to actually, because I wanna move on away from this, uh, um, this graph, but to, uh, to continue talking a little bit, we released in February, which is uh, this one, uh, released here, and then we, we worked on it a little bit less on March, worked on it more uh, on April, May, and June, because in June we released uh, another factory update, the, the big factory that you saw. It took us three months to make. Um, then we were really done with the game for a little while. We went on vacations and such. Um, then we continued working on the game, making more themes. Uh, I think it was the snow update that we made in uh, that released in December, and now actually last couple months we've been ramping up because we're making a new theme and making some new small in between areas. Uh, the new theme is going to be beach. It's going to be great. Um, yeah, so um, that's that's sort of like uh, the hours worked on this. Here's a cumulative chart if you're interested in that. It turns out. In total, all of us together have put in 6,624 hours as an estimate, which is a lot of hours. Never expected I would do that at all, but it totally happened. Okay, so I want to talk a little bit more about uh, the playtesting, uh, because playtesting was actually a really big thing. Like I, like I said, we, we went to um, a lot of events where we playtested, let me actually see if I have a, a picture of the setup that we had for that. Yeah, we have pictures. So here's the, the little booth we, I made. Uh, I was there by myself, so I had to manage all this stuff um, at the same time. We sold Steam keys and posters. 
we even had someone, some volley played, it was kind of funny. Um, but yeah, PAX East, great, great place. But at, at an event like this, a lot of people will play your game and you can distill a lot of knowledge out of these people. Um, but a lot of the things that people say is not always what they mean. And so I actually have a lot of thoughts about how to do playtesting properly that I will actually not go into much right now. But let me just give you the tip of the iceberg uh, for that. And I, I'm going to actually YouTube my own talk. Let's see. Yeah, so if you look for any wrong playtesting, avoiding evil data. Oh, no. Um, I gave a 30-minute talk at uh, GC about how to uh, do playtesting. And I, I talk about this amazing method uh, of asking people from the other side of the world to actually record their gameplay sessions um, wh while they talk into the microphone and play the game. So I can see what they're doing and I can really like, iterate on my game that way. So I'm not, I'm not super big on d collecting data. Um, I'm much bigger on like actually seeing people play, sitting, basically sitting next to them, hearing what they say, but actually without me being there. Um, and uh, a lot of the iterations on hidden folks uh, every, in, in between all those versions were actually made based on these kinds of videos. Yes, it does say, it, do, it did say indeed, playtesting a bad game over here. Oh, maybe you can't even read that. But yeah, that's a, that's a thing. Highly recommend looking this up. I, I think this was something that maybe really helped me create, uh, create hidden folks. Um, okay, so um, how do you organize these kinds of playtests? Let's dive into it. Um, because it's a lot of work, and I didn't do all this by myself. This is where I had uh, Mirta help me um, organize, uh, you know, asking people like, "Hey, do you want to try it? Do you want to um, do you want to play? When do you want to play? What devices can you play on, etc." So we made these massive sprite sheets. Uh, we made these template emails so that we could very quickly like get the list of people that wanted to play, send them this email. Um, sort of like help them, um, help them play the game and help them record and help them send us data and remind them and you know, not really push them but just be like, hey, here's a Steam key, you can play the, get the game for free uh, if you wanna try it. Um, this is how uh, we did that. So that was, that was fun, that was cool. Um, talking about more community stuff because there was a lot more in Hint Folks uh, such as uh, the Discord, that we set up, uh, such as the translations of the game, which were all community translated, which is a lot of work um, if you've never done it before, especially. Um, but th there's, a, there's a massive Discord here that has, well, actually, it doesn't have that many people, but very active people. And uh, as you can see, even, even today, people posted stuff. Pretty great. So um, I don't know what this is. Film tributes? the hell? Um, a lot of people, they talk about, uh, about, about the game, and every time we have a, a version of the game, we um, throw a lot of the text in this massive sprite sheet that we invite hundreds of people to, to edit certain languages. So say I, or actually not me, but, uh, but Bram, who's also in the audience, who he comes up with the hints. Um, I, I, I know we make the levels, but Bram actually comes up with the, with the text of it. And we put it in this massive sprite sheet, which has a lot of, a lot of words. Um, and then there's a Dutch person, a French person, German, actually multiple persons, um, Korean people, Japanese people, who then translate it uh, and put it in the sheet. And then they actually open up the game. Um, and there, then there's a button in the game that allows them to just download the latest translation uh, into, into the game, which is like, pretty cool. You can say update language. Not sure if it even works now. Yeah, it did work. And so now it will, now it will have the latest language uh, that was put in, this, in the big sprite sheet on in the internet into the game. And so people can really quickly put some new text in the game and, uh, and, and actually see it in action. So um, that's sort of like how the community translation works. Um, okay, next up, very cool subject, I think, which is doing business. Yes, it's very strange, maybe. 
maybe not, Amaze is not, I feel, the, the best place to maybe talk about business, but I, I also find it exhilarating and fun and to do and to hang out with like people who can, who can actually mean something um, financially for you, it's great. And so I want to continue talking about these business things. Again, like, keep in mind, I'm sharing things that normally I don't want to share. Um, oh, here we go. Uh, my Apple contact just uh, emailed me something about a promotion, and yeah, that's that, so I have these emails, email conversations with, uh, in this case, people from Apple, um, who, in the, uh, when I started making games and made this Fingal, uh, they reached out to me saying, hey, uh, you're, you made a cool game, let's talk about this, maybe do a promotion next time, and that's, from that point on, I just kept talking to him, and uh, I have... By now, I have uh, contacts with every, like Apple and Google and, and Valve and all these, and Sony and all these platforms that every time that I want to make an update or have something new or have a new game, I can just immediately email them and ask them, hey, uh, what do you think of this? How can I make this game the best game for, for, for the App Store or for Steam? What kind of integrations are you focusing on? And that's really the sort of business that I do. And uh, this is just one, one the, the kinds of emails I send are just like, hey, I'm adding a new area and, and, uh, and controller support. Um, like, I'm not flat out asking for, hey, can you feature me? Give me that big banner on the App Store. That's not what I'm doing. I'm just saying, hey, this is happening. Maybe we can time a promotion. And that actually resulted in a lot of very positive uh, things. Um, uh, folks, wait, what? So, um, one thing that really worked out was that I had never talked to anyone from Valve before I released uh, Hidden Folks. Um, and so, I released Hidden Folks, and it did really well. As a matter of fact, it was the best rated game on Steam for a couple days, which really blows my mind. Um, and so I emailed just a couple random people I managed to gather their email addresses from, and I sent, I sent them this very short email saying, hey, it's doing really well, um, I'm doing an update very soon, maybe we can do something. And this resulted in the first Steam Daily deal, which is the, the cr actually, I think, the craziest promotion you can get in the world of games these days. Um, so sending out these emails uh, is really like the kinds of business, uh, the kinds of things I do as business. Now, um, I wanted to show you this. Um, there's a couple, I can talk a lot more about this, like how Apple wants me to include haptic feedback and how Steam wants me to include Steam uh, trading cards and uh, how all the other platforms want me to do business by actually using their platform very well. So we thought about this a lot, making hint folks, and we did a lot of this, and I think that this actually contributed a lot to, um, to the release. So let's talk about sales numbers. Yes. I, actually, I don't want to... I thought about this a lot, and in the, in the past, I might have, like, set things online. I'm like, nah, I'm not super comfortable about sharing actual numbers, but I do feel very comfortable about showing, like, sales graphs and all that kind of stuff. Um, yes. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll do questions in, in, in a couple minutes. So this is the sales graph for, uh, for Hidden Folks, and just to give you a little bit of perspective, um, in the middle of the spike is when Hidden Folks went break even. Um, so, and I would say maybe this whole spike was for, I think, Sylvain and I, maybe three or four years of savings. So went extremely well. Um, so that was the launch spike. It was a very exciting launch. We were on a lot of websites, which, by the way, I tracked using this cool tool that's going to stop, I believe, called Promoter App, uh, which shows you all the websites that I had to send emails to because release was coming up and I had to send emails to, to press. Uh, when? Oh, it doesn't even have that anymore. Anyway. Um, Hidden folks out now. So this, these are the kinds of emails I sent to press. Where are they? Man, that's a long time ago. 2017. I have too many emails. Oh, here, out now, here. Review press copies available. Some guy I emailed. 
Yeah, so these are the kinds of emails I sent out as sort of marketing, you know, um, telling the world, hey, the game is out, you can get a press copy, um, get it now. We sent out a lot of these kinds of emails with images and links, as few links as possible, trying to keep it very short. Um, so we sent out a lot of these emails, got a lot of responses. We were on a lot of websites because of this, uh, right on the start of the release, and it's, that, that really resulted in this, in this crazy spike that, uh, that we had in the beginning. Can I make this bigger? Yeah, sure. Um, so yeah, that's, that's the release. Let's actually look a little bit more closer at, uh, at all the other things in here, because there's a, a couple of bumps. Um, this bump over, wait, where's my mouse? This bump over here is uh, the Steam Daily deal that I talked about, um, which again is completely crazy how much, how much people downloaded the game during that, uh, that time with I think 33% off or something. Um, also paired with a factory update, so we did a content update and then um, also talked about the, the sale for, uh, with, with Valve uh, and also with the App Store. I think this over here in, during, after September was when the, the new App Store launched. And uh, lucky us, we were there right then uh, with uh, some nice today stories and some smaller minor features that definitely bumped up uh, the sales a little bit uh, during that time. Um, then we became game of the year on the iPads on App Store, which was this spike over here. Um, really lucky again, like, holy shit, that totally happened. Um, then we did a tiny, um, I think, oh, this was actually game of the year. Then here we did a, a, an, another update, the snow area update, and we also launched an Android, which is the little couple tiny, um, actually, you don't even see them. There's a, wait, let me actually go to the cumulative one. It's this little tiny pink, thingy that's, that's in here, that's Android right now. So we, I don't know, for some reason, Hidden Folks didn't work so well for, uh, for Android. Um, blue is iOS, um, green is, um, is on Steam. So, um, so yeah, that's um, the sort of uh, stuff that, uh, that happened. Um, let's see, is there, something, is there something that you guys wanna know? Because I'm, okay, you. You can either walk to the microphone or you can scream it out loud so that everyone can hear it. Right, so he asks, what's, what's up with your pricing strategy? Very businessy question, like it. Um, so we wanted Hidden Folks to be a very premium game, but we also acknowledge that on every platform, say iOS or Steam, pricing works very differently. If you see a Steam game that's, that's two bucks, you're thinking, oh, that, this must be a really cheap game, you know, very cheap, cheap, like the quality must not be that good. Whereas on iOS, if you see a two or three dollar game, you're gonna be like, oh, this is like a, you know, whoa, this is a premium game. So we took all this into account and ended up pricing the game different on different platforms. And as a matter of fact, the game is twice as expensive on Steam and nobody ever said anything about this. It's just, I guess, how the market works. And we all know this, and, and, even, and even players know this. So um, we want it to be a premium game. We were thinking about three or four dollars. We end up just going for four dollars. Uh, and on Steam, it's eight dollars. Um, and we've been doing updates for free because people want it more. And as a matter of fact, and, and the sales show it to you, updates, even if it's a free update, you can still make, make money with that. So you know, I think by now we're sort of done with making free updates and we're gonna be doing DLCs because a lot of people want more. Um, but yeah, that's sort of my, my thoughts about pricing. It's, it's not easy, but I would say think about every, every store individually. Yeah? Strong discount, no. No, I, I'm not a fan of giving away, giving away the game for free. Um, like, I'm an, I feel like we as creators, we're all artists, and, we, and we, we, wor we worked on this for a long time. And so giving away for free, doing, we didn't participate in any giveaways or something. We didn't do a very strong launch sale. I think it was only 10% or something. Um, and only now, after a year and a half, I think we're going down to like a 50% sale for the first time. And that's, I think that's even a month away now. So 
or I, that's, this is all like, okay, again, the business stuff and if you want to pair it with your platforms to, to really make use of, of these kinds of things. But it's, yeah, that's sort of my, uh, my perspective on it. Yes. Right. So the question is, did we make it accessible to win awards? No. <laughs> um, no, I, I think like uh, the first time I saw Hidden Fo um, Sylvain's illustrations, right? I was so intrigued by it. I was like, wow, this is beautiful, this world. And it was that feeling that we always wanted, that I always wanted to give. And what I felt I could add to it was interactions. And I, I, did, I still wanted to be true to that feeling, but I didn't want it to become a, a complicated puzzle game. I didn't want it to become something different than what I had experienced then already. And so it, it stayed simple in design from the start. Uh, and that doesn't mean it was, it was easy to make, but it's, yeah, we wanted it to be simple. And uh, yeah, I don't know, that's probably answer your question. So the question is, how much did we iterate on the original design? So ver from the very start, when I saw his illustrations, I was like, hey, um, maybe we can do something like a searching game or something because that would force people to actually look at this beautiful world that you've made. Um, and that was always the start. Uh, there is, so in a, on a broader sense, uh, not a lot has changed. But on a detailed sense, a lot of things change continuously. And the, the kinds of things that we would be talking about is, uh, for instance, uh, let's go to this area. Let's turn off the sounds for now so you can hear me. The kinds of things that we added that took us a long time to add were things like, if you tap on this garage door, it will wiggle. And that's actually extremely important feedback because if it doesn't do anything, you will never discover that if you tap and hold it, you can actually drag it open. And for a garage door, that might make sense, but for some other objects in Hint folks, that's actually a little bit ambiguous or obscure. And so there were a lot of these like very tiny details uh, in terms of the design of the game that we had to very slowly iterate on. And I think that actually goes for, for almost all of the design. That's everything you see here is just like, we make the first thing that comes to mind, and then we see whether it works, and if it works, great, we keep it. But if it doesn't work, or it sort of works, we keep working on it until it gets to a point where most of the people actually um, understand it. And uh, you know, same thing goes for, for this. Like this tent, it used to be just, uh, a tent, and you wouldn't know that actually if you click it, um, you can open it up. And so visually, we added these little curls that would actually make it very visually clear, oh, maybe there's something below these tents. And then there's like these couple of extra pixels here that then really s sort of spoil that there is something in there. So there was a lot of iteration on that level, yes. And that's just like continuous. That's, I, I would say that's building the game, right? Um, so yeah, a lot of that, lot of that happened. Um, question in the back? Oh yes, okay, so the question is, Hin folks seems to be very different from the game I've made previously. Like previously I've made all these socially awkward games that make people touch each other and do crazy things. Hin folks seems more like a game game from that perspective. Um, I really enjoyed making this. As you saw, there, a lot of work goes into it, but adding all these small design decisions the continuously is just, I think, really exhilarating and fun. And so I don't mind, but I do want to go back to making some weird shit again. Yeah. Um, and I cannot, cannot wait to, uh, to do that. So I don't, I, I don't feel like I need to stick to this one red line that, that uh, goes through my life uh, just, to, just to be consistent so people understand what I am and what I do. I don't, I don't feel that. So I'm just going to continue doing game, the game design I like and, um, and continue making games that way. So there's one more tiny question here. So he's asking uh, the sales on, on Steam. We have Windows, Mac, and Linux. 90% is, is Windows. 9% is Mac and 1% is Linux. Linux, not worth it. Financially, financially, sorry, uh, just lots of bugs. You can't test because you, nobody has a Linux computer, only the hardcore peoples. <laughs> Ooh, flame. Anyway, uh, thanks for listening. I hope it was very clear. And if you have more questions, please come to me afterwards. I'm really happy to just tell you everything about it. <laughs>